Greetings, everybody. This is Timur. Apologies for the delay. We had some technical issues with updating the Zoom version. Uh, now we're back online and welcome to our webinar, speaking about migrating to exify.io and digital collaboration. We'll start this presentation and let's go ahead with it. Before uh, we start the main content, I'd like to speak about uh, a few important points. The goal of this webinar is to help users understand what exabyte.io is and how to benefit from using it. This is the second webinar in the monthly recurring series. Uh, every first Friday of the month, we speak about getting started. Every third Friday, we speak about advanced topics, and this is our current session. Every participant should be a registered user, and every participant will receive a copy of this presentation in a PDF format, so you don't need to take notes. And there are also going to be a recording that we will distribute separately. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, we encourage you to ask uh, them right on. Please use the chat or Q&A functionality to do so. With uh, the lockdowns and everybody working from home, uh, this functionality should be already familiar to you. If not, uh, please look at the Zoom bar, um, the items bar, and chat or Q&A uh, would be the options. We will assume here that uh, the webinar attendees are computational material scientists familiar with tools like Quantum Espresso, VASP, or similar, and understand the basics of Linux and uh, Unix operating environments. We will assume that the users have a set of established scripts or input files that they use to perform the calculations and would like to know how to migrate those scripts to the XY platform and how to collaborate uh, with other scientists online. For that, there are two basic options. Number one is users can bypass the web interface entirely and use one of the alternative connection methods, such as a command line environment, to um, edit the scripts and input files and run simulation jobs. The good side of it is that it's quick and familiar to many. The bad side of it is that uh, this approach is error prone and it's difficult to use and share those scripts. The second approach is to adopt the Exabyte platform way and create a material entities, workflow entity, and job with uh, the material and workflow. This will require us to learn the XWIT approach. So there is a, a learning curve to it and there is a barrier. However, once we do that, we will be able to reuse this approach for multiple materials and uh, there will be assistance in reviewing and sharing this information. In terms of cl collaboration, we have two similar options. One way is to bypass the web interface and use the file system tools. Files file system folders for organizational accounts especially to share the information. And the second approach is to adopt the Exabyte platform way and um, create the entities and then facilitate team-based permissions uh, through the Exabyte platform accounts. And I will speak about both today. Here is a quick agenda. We'll first um, speak about the platform infrastructure, what kind of connection methods we have, um, the login nodes, the file system, and shared access to data. And then we will speak about materials, workflows, and jobs in more details. And we'll finish with specific topics about collaboration and how we can share these entities uh, within an account and between different accounts in the platform. All participants can request access to the webinar account, which is an organizational account in our platform. And it has advanced features like command line access in, um, already enabled for it. So you can try them and uh, see how they work for you uh, yourself. During the webinar, we will see a recorded videos of the functionality to prevent any kind of uh, blockages and to make it into a smoother experience. And you can follow this presentation and perform equivalent actions on your own using the webinar account. Okay, let's start the main content with the platform infrastructure. And here is the diagram that represents the platform architecture. It may appear a bit complex, but really there are 
a few important components that we have to keep in mind. Uh, there's the web browser that uh, users are accessing the platform through. And here is the cluster, the computational infrastructure where the calculations are being performed. In between those, there's a database, um, there's a web interface, uh, there is a login node. And what's important to understand is that there are multiple different ways to connect to this infrastructure. And number one is by using a web browser and going through the web interface. Number two uh, and um, six, as, as written here, is to use further use additional tools through the web browser that facilitate the remote desktop and uh, command line connection through the web terminal. And in this case, we are gonna be accessing the login node, which provides the command line environment. We can also use a um, secure shell client to connect directly to the login node. And the final option is to use RESTful API to communicate directly with uh, the database. And we will be speaking mostly about options um, SSH, remote desktop, and web terminal today. Okay. Through SSH, um, we can use any kind of uh, a terminal client like PuTTY or Mac OS terminal. For web-based terminal, we don't have to have anything else besides the web browser. And the desktop connection is equivalent. It also is facilitated through the web browser. And the RESTful API we will uh, leave out of today's discussion. So to enable the secure shell connection, we have to establish the key pairs, the pair of a public and private key. And the private key, of course, it is private, so you should never share it with anyone. The public key you can upload to our uh, web application in order to establish the connection. So once you do that, it's going to look something like this uh, under the preferences in your account. If you scroll down to SSH keys, you will be able to add a key, add a public key. And then once it's um, shown in green, you should be able to use this key to connect. The second option, the web terminal, um, can be launched from the web, as uh, is in the name. To do that, we need to open the right-hand sidebar and click on the web terminal option in it, right? Here, we can do things like listing the directories, essentially all the commands that are available on the command line. Plus, we can upload and download the files by drag and dropping them onto the webinar, onto the, sorry, onto the web window. And we can also copy paste information by using the, um, the copy paste dialog, which we can open by clicking Control Shift uh, Command on Mac. Remote desktop is another option. It can be opened in a similar way. We open the right-hand sidebar, click remote desktop, and then we are presented with a, a familiar desktop session. So here we have access to multiple applications and uh, the file system, just like we would on our own computer. Okay. The, um, to, in order to be able to use the file system, we need to understand a little bit more about the way it is structured. And essentially, you can think about the login node as an aggregator, which provides access to multiple computational clusters. And these computational clusters, they can reside on different cloud providers. So for example, today in production, we have cluster 001, which resides on Amazon Web Services, and cluster 007 that resides on Microsoft Azure. And that is the way for us to provide um, this diverse infrastructure hosted by multiple cloud providers to our users. Now, in order to be able to access the uh, specific information, these clusters are mounted at uh, certain mount points on the login node. So cluster 001 is mounted at cluster 001-home username for a user with a particular username. An equivalent approach is used for organizations too, but um, they are located under cluster 001 that's shared. If we connect to the login node and open the home directory for a user, we'll see that um, there are certain folders <coughs> that include links to each of the computational clusters. So to be able to browse the data that is resided, uh, residing on one of the computational clusters, we provided these links inside the home folder. And if you navigate into one of these links, 
you'll see that there are further subdivision onto additional system directories that include um, links to organizational accounts. For example, I am a member of Exabyte.io account and I see a link to its data here under cluster 001. A data folder that contains the, the web originated jobs. So all the jobs that originate on the web are organized inside this data folder. And then there are links to the Dropbox folder that can be used to uh, store and share small data, information like scripts or Jupyter notebooks or some potential files. And there is a folder called job script templates that contains um, command line templates for the simulation job. The Dropbox folder, again, is connected to most parts of uh, our infrastructure, the web interface, uh, the login node, the uh, computational master node. And that's a way for us to share the information between all these different parts of the infrastructure. It, uh, by default, it only accepts up to one gigabyte of data. So we are not meant, uh, we do not mean this as a storage for bulky data, but uh, for things like scripts or set of potentials, it's, a, it's really convenient. Jupyter Notebooks, for example. User data contains um, jobs that originate on the web interface and they're organized in a certain manner. And an example of, of it uh, would be like so, when we have a job inside the project name default, and we name this job something like this with a new job November 11, 2018, and it has a certain ID in the database. So we, we take all of this together and we concatenate them and uh, that's the name that we will ultimately get on the command line. So this job will be inside 7-default if the user uh, name for the user that owns this job is student and the name of the project is default. And then the, the, uh, the job name will be concatenated and made into a machine readable format and uh, concatenated with the ID itself. A similar approach we uh, deploy for organizational accounts, but again, we uh, store this data inside cluster dash 001, share groups account name. So for exabyte.io, account name will be substituted with exabyte.io here, right? Now, why is it important to understand this? It's important to understand it to uh, be able to get access to the information if, uh, if certain functionality uh, is yet to be implemented on the web application, for example. So there is a way today to um, use additional applications like Xcristen and um, analyze the uh, results of the calculations performed on command line using remote desktop. So in order to do so, we will have to uh, start the calculation from the web and then open a remote desktop and navigate to the folder that contains the results of uh, this calculation. This is a quick demonstration of how we can visualize the Fermi surface created uh, as part of the uh, simulation that originated on the web application. So a few notes uh, about the remote connection. Remote connection is an alternative way to access the platform. It can be enabled upon request for the users that desire to use it. There are three options, uh, web terminal, remote desktop, and uh, secure shell session. Remote sessions are connected to a login node with a separate home folder for each user. The home folder has links to directories for compute clusters. Command line jobs must be submitted from within a cluster directory, not any other ones inside the login home. There is a variety of software packages available both via remote desktop and via command line modules. Do we have any questions at this point? I don't think I see any, so let's continue on and speak about materials. So now, how do we utilize the Exabyte platform approach to run a calculation that we have, uh, let's say, stored on our disk right now in these two files? So let's assume that we have a quantum espresso calculation that consists of a self-consistent run and non-self-consistent run. I have the input files here, one on the left, one on the right. And I will explain now how we can create a material 
uh, using the information contained inside these two files. So first of all, we need to inspect the two, make sure that they contain all the necessary information. And the second step number one <clears throat> in, in this progression is to prepare the input files, um, understand what's inside the input files, what is stored there. All right, first of all, we have to look at the, uh, the crystal lattice parameters and see that uh, here we're using a rav equal to zero. So we have to look at the cell parameters of quantum espresso input files to get the actual lattice uh, constants. And we can see that this is uh, the tetragonal lattice where uh, two of the lattice constants are the same. Uh, all the degrees are 90s and 90 degrees, as we can see, and the Z dimension is a little bit larger than the X and Y. We also see that the atomic positions here are listed in crystal coordinates and the, uh, the atoms contained inside this material are also listed here. Once we know this information, we go online and start the materials designer session by clicking on the plus button. So we navigate to our account, we navigate to the materials list, click the plus button, and we open the materials designer session. By default, it opens with the default material, which in my case is silicon FCC, so face-centered cubic silicon. I do not need this material. I'd like to work uh, with its copy. So I copy the material to avoid modifying the original one, I'm clicking uh, at, uh, on top at the, uh, at the edit menu, and then selecting the clone option. I then remove the original item from the materials designer session. Then I change the name for this material and put the right uh, formula for it. Calcium tungsten 04 from uh, 04 from the WSCF. All right. The next step is to set up the crystal lattice parameters using the WSCF input file. Then I extend the crystal lattice dialog. I select simple cubic as the, sorry, I could select triclinic as the lattice type to be able to modify all of the lattice parameters independently. And then I copy the lattice constants. I remember that they are actually written in boards in atomic units in, inside quantum espresso, so I have to transfer, translate them to angstroms, which I do using Google, right? And substitute lattice parameters A and B. And also calculate lattice parameter C, put it into the form, and set up all the angles to be 90 degrees. Then I apply the edits, and here you can see on the right, in the visualization, 3D um, visualization, I can see that the lattice parameters are now adjusted to reflect on the material from the WSF input. Not the crystal basis yet. It still constitutes the silicon uh, that I worked at, uh, with by default, but the lattice parameters, you see the box here is adjusted. The next step naturally is to adjust the crystal basis. And we have two options to work either in crystal units or in Cartesian units. In this case, we have crystal units inside the input file, so we keep the default and just copy paste the content from an espresso input file. Okay, now we can see that the structure is properly changed and it indeed looks like the structure that we wanted. The last step in this progression is to save the material. For that, I click on the input output menu, I click on save and added a tag from the WSCF to this entry and just save the current material by clicking OK. After the loader is done spinning, we have the notification here. And if we go back and exit the session, so if we click on input output and click exit, inside the list of our materials, we can see the new entry. And it has the tags that we created for it. Okay. So that's how we can take a material from um, a script that we've been working with and migrate it to create an entity in the Xbox platform. Another option, and that's the option that we covered earlier in the previous webinar uh, about getting started with the platform, is to use uh, a format that we support a direct input from, 
we support CIF and Postgar. And uh, if you take the Equinum Espresso input file and go online to um, this caminfo.org, there is an option to translate the input format from PWCF to Postcard. And if you do that and um, upload the Postcard using the upload functionality of the platform, you will get an equivalent result. Okay. There are no other questions at this point. Let's continue on to the workflow. So once we have the material information online, we need to also copy the logic that is involved during the execution of this workflow. And for that, <clears throat> we will use a similar approach, which is to create a workflow from scratch using a workflow designer in this case. So what we do first is uh, we open the workflow designer session. I think I should skip that step. Let me go back. So in this demonstration, um, I have SCF and NSCF input files, so those will constitute the um, uh, units inside the workflow. And to open the workflow designer, I'm going to the workflows list in my account and clicking the plus button, just like for materials. Here I'm presented with an empty new workflow. My next step would be to adjust its uh, name at the top and adjust the name of the first sub workflow, so I'm naming them accordingly and we can see here that uh, the first sub workflow is shown in the list of sub workflows we only going to need one sub workflow for this session for this uh, uh, workflow editing session so we then proceed to add a unit to the first sub workflow and we add an execution unit appended to the current click apply and we see that PW underscore SCF unit is now a member part of this workflow. To edit this unit, we click on its name, click the box there, and we now are presented with the unit editor. As you can see, uh, for Quantum Espresso, we have multiple executables and multiple flavors that are supported. And one of the flavors is PW underscore SCF which constitutes and represents the self-consistent yield calculation. So for this uh, particular unit, we don't need to change the flavor, but for the next one, we will be able to adjust uh, the flavor using NSCF to get the right template for the input. We then scroll down and we see the content of the template that uh, in fact has the calculation to be equal to uh, SCF, just like we desired. <clears throat> and it has a certain predefined set of tags that we assume inside the PW underscore SCF flavor template. Now, these tags are not quite the same as the ones that I have in the input file. So now I have to go through the uh, name list and make sure that the tags are equivalent, which is exactly what I do. So I look at uh, those three tags and copy them into under the control name list of um, the template on the web. The same thing I do with system. I see that the smearing is different, so I copy that. And then I see that the electrons card is different. And, and I adjust its content, right? I remove the ions and cell uh, nameless because there is no relaxation involved in this workflow. And then as you can see, I'm not touching anything related to atomic species or key points because these contain the template variables that will be populated based on the material information provided. All right, so now if I go to the preview tab, I can see that my file is indeed properly rendered. And its content now is according to what I have in the input file, except for the material plot. Okay. So now the second step for me would be to repeat this procedure for all the other units that I have in the workflow which it would be only one in this case. So I create PW NSCF unit by adding it to this workflow. And then I, by default, it creates PW SCF. So we have to go and adjust the flavor, right? PW NSCF in this case. And as you can see, the, uh, the default set of properties that are extracted from the calculation and the monitors and the template, all of them are adjusted accordingly when we select 
the WNSCF as the, as the flavor. <clears throat> so if I scroll down to the template input, I now do exactly the same. I, I adjust all the name lists to reflect on the content of the original inputs that I have on a disk. All right. And now I have uh, all the content that uh, I desire inside the template. I can preview it and come back to the uh, workflow level. So the next step is for me to save uh, the resulting workflow. And I, before doing that, I adjust its name. I call it SCF and SCF workflow from PWSCF input. And I also add a tag so that I can easily find it in the future from PWSCF input. And then I click on the uh, check mark at the top, the save button, and I exit the workflow designer session and I see the workflow at the top of uh, my list. All right, so this is how we take the logic contained inside the uh, Quantum Espresso input files and migrate it into the XY platform. Now the workflow that we have just created is um, contains many template variables, which makes it reusable. Instead of having the material information imprinted inside the workflow, we retain the material information in the form of uh, template variables, allowing us to quickly reuse this uh, workflow logic for multiple different materials. And I will demonstrate to you in the next section of this uh, presentation, how we can create a job using the material and workflow. The second option for the creation of the workflow uh, under my account would be to copy a similar workflow from the workflows bank. As we um, grow uh, the XY platform, there is more and more people that are joining and creating content and sharing it within uh, the workflows bank and materials bank. So there's um, a big chance that somebody have created the workflow that you're gonna need in your daily um, operations. And what we can do is, uh, especially when we're just starting, uh, we can navigate to the workflows bank by opening the left-hand sidebar, clicking bank and workflows, and searching for the properties that um, are of interest to you. So if you're looking to calculate uh, the band structure, the electronic band structure, then these are all the workflows that have this property inside itself. And you can copy one or more of them to your account, right? So when we come back to the list of workflows under my account, I can see that this copy has, has been created. So instead of starting with uh, a completely uh, empty workflow like we did during um, the option one. In the option two, we can uh, start with a workflow that somebody else have created on the platform. And we would advise users that just starting to select the workflows created by curator's account. So here, if you click on those three dots, you can see uh, the account that have created these workflows. And curator's account is a system level account that um, the members of our Exabyte team are using to put highly curated, uh, good quality information. So if you select the uh, uh, curator's uh, workflow, it is likely to work well and to not produce any errors. All right. No questions still. So I'm going forward with uh, speaking about jobs. So now that we have created material and workflow entities, we can proceed to create calculations or simulation jobs. And there are two options again. We can create the jobs from command line interface. For that, we did not need uh, the material and workflow entity. We could just uh, copy the information directly to through command line session. I have covered that in one of the prior webinars, so I'm not going to be speaking about this today. But I'll speak instead about the second option where we can use the web interface to create simulations. For that, first, we have to make sure that we are inside one of the projects. We won't be able to create a job 
without navigating to the project in the web interface. And by default, we have two projects available to the users. One is called default, which is uh, as the name it entails, should be your first choice by default. And the second one is called external. And external project is where uh, the data that you upload, let's say you have calculations uh, that uh, you performed internally and um, outside of the XY platform. We also have an option to upload this data to have it indexed and stored inside our database. And if you do that, if you upload um, the information from external sources, the jobs, the resulting jobs will be created inside this external project. So really, we do not recommend running calculations from within this project because it should contain the data that originates outside of the XML platform. So here we go to the default project, click on the plus button again to open the job designer. And here we are presented with a job designer session where we adjust the name of the job and select the material that we have just created and select the workflow that we have just created. So now we have pre-initiated this job designer session with a material and a workflow and we are ready to proceed to the next step. Next step would be to inspect the workflow and see um, whether it has the right content. So if you scroll down here, you can see that uh, this is the template content. Uh, excuse me, let's go back for a second. So when we expect inspecting the workflow, we need to scroll down and inspect the unit content. So if we click on uh, the preview tab here, we can see that the material that this workflow uh, is going to be previewed with, this, the, the, the unit input file for this workflow, now has changed to the one that we have selected for this job session. And so that's the material that we would like to work with in this calculation. And if you are careful, we will see that uh, the K-point sampling, for example, is different from the one that we have had in the original input file. So now what we can do is we can copy the original K-point sampling and adjust it inside the important settings form. So if I navigate to uh, the important settings tab of uh, the sub workflow editor and scroll down, I can see that pw underscore SEF has a certain K-point grid which I can modify. So I adjust it now to reflect on what we have inside the original input file. And I do the same for PW and SCF. All right. And that will reflect inside the uh, input template content. I also adjust the name to have a note for myself in the future that the key grid here was edited. Next step is to set up the compute parameters. Uh, there's one question here. Okay, we'll get to the questions in a moment. In the meanwhile, uh, here is how we set up the compute parameters. We navigate to the compute tab and select the time limit. So the maximum time for which this calculation is allowed to run for. In this case, it's gonna be one hour. And if the calculation exceeds one hour, it will be terminated. So be careful uh, about the time limit that we use here to make sure that the calculation goes through. And then for the most uh, production calculations, this is a relatively large um, unit cell for a material. I suggest uh, for most production calculations to select ordinary regular or ordinary fast queues if we are submitting multiple calculations at once. So here we have uh, one nodes uh, one node and 18 cores on cluster 001 is a good choice for any production calculation. And then I also select uh, the notifications to be sent to me when the, jobs is, uh, when the job is started, aborted, and ended. And then I click on save the job in the header. And when it is saved, I can see that it has been created in the jobs list under the default project. When it's first created, it is in the pre-submitted status, shown in, in the bright blue. <clears throat> then I can select this entry 
in the list by clicking on this drop down and select run to submit this job. What happens then? The job is uh, transitioned from the pre submitted to submitted status immediately. And it is waiting for the infrastructure to be provisioned. We can see now that the infrastructure should be provisioned and the job should be started starting within the next 10 minutes. So we continue to wait and we can see that within two minutes the job is indeed started. So it goes from submitted to active status. So S and dark blue is submitted. A orange is active. And then when it is active, I can navigate into the job by clicking on its name in the list, right? And um, if I then select, scroll down and select the uh, PWSF unit, I will be able to monitor the progress of this unit in the real time. So I can see the output as it's been posted to the application. I can see um, the charts for the convergence also being posted to the application in the real time. And when this unit is complete, its color is changing from orange to green. And the next unit, as you can see, is being active next. So I open the second unit, PWNSCF. I can see its output as it is progressing. This calculation is uh, taking a few minutes to complete. And then at the end, when it is complete, we can see that both of these units are colored green. <clears throat> the one that we currently have selected is highlighted in gray, and it also has the outline highlighted. So when the calculation is complete, we can see uh, that there are results and file status that appear at the top. And we can navigate to the results tab and see the result, uh, resulting properties extracted for each of the units. So for example, PWSF extracted uh, total energy as a property, extracted the pressure, the atomic forces, and so on, right? And if we go to the files tab, we can see all the files that are produced inside this calculation in the original folders that these files were arranged into. If you click on any of these files, we can either visualize them or we can download these files to a local system. The last part here is that if you go back to the compute session, uh, to the compute tab, we will be able to see the cost of this calculation by clicking on this link. Okay, so that's how we run a job. <clears throat> and optionally, uh, the calculations that we run, we can share with other people within the XNet platform. So here, for example, I'm using the webinar account to run a calculation, but most of the time I'm using my personal account under my name. So I would like to share this calculation with my personal account to be able to get access to it um, inside my personal account. To do that, I'm selecting this job in the list and clicking share <clears throat> and then selecting my account and giving my account to read permissions on this job, right? So here I can see that the, the job is accessible to all platform users because it's, it's public and it is also accessible to me under my account. So if I now navigate back to my account, I will demonstrate it in a moment. I will be able to see this job there too. So a quick summary of the, the jobs, uh, running jobs functionality. <clears throat> Command line jobs is one option, quick to start, but difficult to scale. More difficult than the second option, with, which is using the user interface and web application to create uh, the entities materials and workflows and create simulation jobs. This approach can deal with multiple materials at the same time. So it could be high throughput calculations that we're launching from a single job designer session. It allows us to organize data in database by default. And it also enables collaboration where we can share information between different people, different accounts. Most people use a, a limited number of workflows. So really we have to create maybe five, 10 uh, different workflows at most. And once these are created, we can apply them to as many materials as we want. So it becomes a, a, an easier task over time. Okay, so 
I think we have a question before going to uh, sharing and collaboration. We have a question from Raimundo. Could you show an example of a molecular absorbing and reacting on the surface of a metallic particle using NAB? Uh, we do have an example and uh, I'll get to it um, at the end of this presentation, just to be conscious of the time. We have an example inside uh, the documentation online. I will demonstrate to you how to find it and how to follow it. But uh, let's first go through the main content of this presentation to be conscious of other people's time. <clears throat> So now let's speak about the sharing and collaboration a bit more in detail. Here is the, a snapshot of an account. And as a user of the platform, I can have access to multiple accounts. To see the accounts that I have access to, I need to open my accounts page by navigating to the opening the right hand sidebar and going to my accounts. And so here are all the accounts that I have access to. Here is my personal account and all the four different organizational accounts that I am a member of. If I would like to use the platform under one of this, I have to click on its name. And here you can see that uh, the entities that I'm uh, getting access to by navigating through the platform have changed to reflect on the entities owned by the seminar account. So instead of seeing my jobs and materials, right, I'm now seeing the materials and jobs and workflows created and owned by this organizational account. When I go back to my personal account, I see different entries there. For the organizational account, we have the ability to have multiple members and <clears throat> These members can be added to the organizational account by going to the people tab and clicking on the plus button and then selecting users by their username, like so. And once we have added the users, we can assign certain teams and assign permissions and entities to these teams. So let me demonstrate how it works. We can create a team and we can assign a certain set of permissions to this team. So for example, in this case, I'm creating a best team that has read permissions, right? Only read permissions on the ent entities that um, the team is owning. Okay, so then next step would be to add members to this team. So I go back to the teams tab, I open the, um, the team, and then I add a user or multiple into this team. So now this team contains certain people. After that, I add the entities into this team. So by default, there are no entities in the team. So the team is just uh, blank, but we can add certain entities like materials, workflows and jobs to this team so that its members have the corresponding access to this entity. So in this case, the team is read only. So material that I'm adding to it will be accessible to the people within this team in a read only manner, right? Okay, so the, here is how it works. I select the material, I add it and it's present here in the team's materials tab. The same can be repeated for jobs and workflows. It works in an equivalent way. Now, when I have, um, a yeah, material or job or workflow entry, there are different access levels that are possible for this um, entity. And this different access levels can be demonstrated with these four uh, entries that I have here. It can either be accessible to myself only, which is what it is by default to the person who can create it, this uh, entity, or it can be shared with um, um, well, if I create an entity by default, it is either accessible to me only or it is accessible if it's created under the organizational account. It is accessible to other members of this organizational account. So by default, the entity is private to an account only. Then uh, there is an option to share this entity with another account. 
it could be a personal account, it could be an organizational account, it doesn't matter in this case. There is an option to share an entity with all other accounts in the platform. There is an option to share the entity outside of the Exabyte platform. So you can send a link to someone and they can access this entity without being the platform user. And there is an option to share a particular entity with anyone on the web, which means that it will be indexed by search engines like Google. And uh, here's how we do all of this for. So to be able to share the entry with another account, I have to select this account here, the list um, under the share dialog. So I, I click on the entry again here. I select the share tool in the top. I select the account and then I click on the read to give it the read permission. All right, so this is how the entity shared directly with another account. To share it with all the accounts in the platform, I select the public instead of uh, the account name. And now it's going to be select as it's going to be shared with uh, the public, which is all users registered in the platform. To share it outside the platform and uh, only with users that have explicit link, I select anyone with a link. And correspondingly to share it with anyone on the web, I select any, anyone on the web. So that's the way to establish access levels for the entities. And you can see here that in the list of the entries, we can see the access levels explicitly set. Now, there are also a way to see which entities were shared with me and uh, which entities are shared publicly. And I will demonstrate to you now how to do so. First of all, the entities that are shared with me can be uh, accessed by navigating to shared with me page accessible from the left-hand sidebar. When we go here, we have a list of um, entities that have been shared with uh, you by other accounts, with the, um, the account that you're currently working on by other accounts. So we can see how it works here. I can select an entity and give explicit access to this entity to another account. Right, and either if the uh, the table now reflects the adjusted access levels. So if I go to uh, and navigate to the shared with me tab, I can see the entities that are shared uh, with my account, just like I did before. So I shared this calcium tungsten O4 job with my personal account. And here I am logged in under my personal account and that's how it's going to look like in the platform. Right, so I navigate to share it with me. I go to the jobs tab. Here's the job that I have just shared with myself from the seminar account. Now, if I'd like to see um, all the publicly shared content, then I equivalently can navigate to the shared publicly page by opening the left-hand sidebar too. And here is the snapshot that we did back in April. And these are all the jobs that are publicly shared from all the platform users. So they're gonna be quite a bit of a content. You might need to scroll through and uh, maybe apply search to see something that uh, you're interested in. We go to share publicly and then navigate to the jobs. Sometimes we need to adjust the, we need to adjust the number of jobs uh, present in the list. Uh, by default it's 20 and most of them at the top will be uh, considering, uh, will be showing the job sets which contain multiple jobs. So if we change it to 50, we will be able to see more of the individual jobs in the list. Okay, the last point that I wanted to make uh, here is about using the entity description. So for each of the entities, we have an option to add a description where we 
can put a small command and um, explain what happens inside a particular calculation, for example. So if I go to and navigate to a job, it could be a finished job, it could be a job still in, in running or still in preparation, and click on this um, I icon with the, the information icon button with the information icon, I can see this description description um, menu. And I can use this um, text area to type a description. And we can use Markdown to put headers and uh, utilize the Markdown format to put things like links and even um, code base or formulas. So in this case, I'm just uh, demonstrating how it works and adjusting the description for this entity. When I go back to the list of um, jobs, I can enable this ID and description column here by clicking on those three dots and selecting it in the list. And then I will be able to see the description right there in the list of jobs. So this is a, a convenient way for multiple users to exchange notes about the job or to retain some specific logic for, um, for a job or for material to come back and see it explicitly in the future. All right. Um, we, so we have uh, surfaced the concept of materials and workflows bank. And really what it is, it's a collection of unique entities. So by default, the entities that are created uh, by accounts could be duplicated. So each account can have a copy of um, a material of its own. And to avoid duplication and to see how many unique entities we have, we have also implemented the entity bank collection. So if three accounts have equivalent materials, we have one corresponding entry inside materials bank. The same is true for the workflows. Unique entities are collected inside the bank. And if uh, an account has private data enabled for it, then no other accounts will have access to the bank entity. And if they don't, if they use public data, then other accounts will be able to see the um, bank entities that are created by a certain account. Okay, so let me summarize here. We have um, entities that can be shared within one account and only that account for a secure and safe collaboration. We have account teams that can utilize different permission schemes and allow members to perform different actions on the entities according to these permissions. We have sharing enabled between individual accounts, um, either within the platform or outside the platform too. And we have entities that support metadata, description and tags to help users exchange information about uh, these shared entities. And unique entities are also consolidated inside the entity bank which provides another layer uh, for the sharing and collaboration. All right, I think I'm through with the main content of this presentation. There was no other questions except Raimundo. So let me try and demonstrate to you uh, how we can, how we can um, run an NED calculation. So one thing that I'd like to suggest is to, always try and search. Uh, uh, so documentation that we have online at docs.exabrite.io contains uh, uh, quite a bit of information and it contains tutorials. If we go to um, tutorials button here, we have them arranged in a certain um, way here in a certain category, categorization. And if we go to density functional theory and chemical properties, we can see there is a reaction energy profile that we have for quantum espresso and for VASP. And here we can see an example NEB calculation and how to set it up, how to run it. And uh, we can also have a step-by-step -step video tutorial available to our users here. Right? It speaks about um, a simple calculation, but all the steps for the NEB uh, setup and uh, the calculation setup will be exactly the same. Now, <clears throat> You have been asking about the molecule absorbing and reacting on the surface. So let's try and search for the surface there. 
and you can see that there's a surface and slab generator, there's a surface energy, and do we have anything else? Create the gold surface, create a molecule on a surface. Okay, so we have that as part of the tutorial too. Let's navigate into it. And there is a tutorial that tells us how to create, put benzene molecule, for example, on a surface represented uh, on the gold surface as it's shown here. So here is a benzene molecule on the gold surface. And this is a tutorial that explains how to do exactly that, how to create the structure. So by combining the two tutorials, I hope uh, you know, we'll be able to set up the material structure first. And then by going back to the NMB tutorial, the following steps here, you will be able to set up the calculation that does the NAB match elastic band <clears throat> calculation inside the platform. All right, so that's how we use NAB method and apply it to the molecular elements on the surface calculation. Okay, do we have any other questions? Anything else? It doesn't look like at this point. Uh, Raimundo, if you have any other uh, questions or comments, you're welcome to speak out. If it was clear and no other questions uh, exist, then I will call this, um, I will finish our uh, session at this point. So thank you very much for joining us today. Again, if you have uh, any questions, the documentation is usually a good place to start before um, uh, utilizing any other support channels. But um, this is why we have um, the webinars to answer the questions that our users have about the platform operation. So please feel free to join us either in two weeks when we speak about getting started or in about a month for the next advanced topic session. For now, thanks everybody and have a good day, stay safe.